Mohsin, welcome to Waterstones. Uh, I should say, welcome to London. Thank um, you. When, when did you arrive in London? Uh, a week ago, okay. on Friday last. This is, this is an important beginning, I think, to, to our conversation because your book, Exit West, um, deals with people moving around the world, uh, in this case, sort of refugees, but the conceit of the book is that they're able to do so almost instantly through these magic doors, I guess we could call them. Yes. But this is something we, people do every day, of course, moving from one country to another, um, as you have done. And I wanted to start off actually by asking, because of your life having been born in Pakistan but having been educated in America, you've lived in London, what do you consider home? Uh, do you consider yourself to have just the one or are there several? Um, home has become a pretty complicated thing. Uh, you know, when somebody asks the question of where you are from, uh, it's for everybody a very complicated question. Mm. It's just that many of us imagine it can be answered simply. You know, I'm from London or I'm from Lahore. Um, but if you take the question seriously, where you're from is lots of different stuff. You know, what made you? And, uh, and for me, uh, there's no way to give an uncomplicated answer to that question. And, and, uh, and home is similarly complicated. So Lahore is home in the sense that I live in the same house where I grew up and my uh, kids play with their grandparents every day as I did uh, and, uh, and so it might seem that I haven't moved at all but uh, I've been moving, you know, the middle has been a lot of movement. Um, when I'm in London I have elements of home that begin to kick in. When I'm in New York, uh, California, Lahore, those are my, my longest homes. But also, when I travel, I have this weird kind of nomadic gaze. So if I arrive in Tokyo, mm -hmm. I immediately begin to wonder, you know, what is it like to live here? Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I can't go to a place without starting to fantasize about what life there would be like. And, uh, and so um, home is always uh, uh, a, a conflicted, partial feeling for me. It always feeds into the idea of identity, doesn't it? Because we do get some of our identity from where we live, but we do also, of course, get our identity from who we are ourselves and from the people around us. Do, do you have any feelings about which is the strongest of those things that feeds into our identity? Is it a cultural thing mainly, or is it...? Well, I, I think that um, what happens is that our identity actually is incredibly complex. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and we have a language for it uh, and a cultural frame for it, which is, which is completely yeah. simplified. So we imagine that you know, this person is a rectangle, uh, you know, British perhaps, and that person is a circle, you know, Pakistani. Um, but they're not. Uh, the British person, if you examine the edges of their supposedly rectangular shape, you find all kinds of serrations that this one likes sushi, and this one likes you know, children's books of a particular type, and this one likes to dance in this way, or this kind of music. Um, and so when we encounter each other, we wind up interfacing on lots of elements of that jagged edge of identity. Uh, it, it is easier to imagine that your identity is simple, um, I suppose, when people tell you that it's simple, and, um, and you encounter people who superficially seem like yourself. But, but I think everybody feels like a foreigner, actually. Um, when I was a kid, I used to uh, be a kind of chameleon. So in Pakistan, more Pakistani. In America, more American, to just blend in. Um, in a way, I try to reconfigure the edges of my identity to match the you know, shape around me. Is this more circular or more square? Um, as I got older, I realized there's a lot of effort involved in doing that. And, uh, um, and I thought, you know, maybe just best to be sort of a strange, hybrid, mongrel creature. Um, and when I began to do that, to, um, to modulate or to do a little bit less of the color changing, the shifting, um, I started to realize that everybody else feels foreign too. So, um, you know, the person next to you in London who's British might come from a part of England that's very different from London uh, or Scotland or Northern Ireland or Wales. Um, 
a uh, woman might have been one of six siblings, only one of whom was a girl. Um, somebody bit can be gay in a family where everybody else is straight. Um, you can be a poet in the engineering faculty. And so the, the, the feeling of foreignness actually is, is, is pretty universal. Um, so when I began to allow myself to feel foreign, rather than starting to think of myself as more disconnected from people around me, oddly enough, I wound up feeling more connected to them, both in terms of as actual human beings I was meeting and interacting with, but also in my ability to, to give myself permission to write characters. Mm. Um, I started to expand my sense of what I would allow myself to imagine because people that formerly seemed to me to be different from me suddenly seem potentially less so. The central characters uh, in Exit West, um, despite coming from the same country and the, the, dealing with the same problems, when they, when they move uh, to, to other countries through the book, they find, uh, I suppose, the things that m brought them together start to, to dissipate slightly. And um, there are those differences you've already mentioned, that if you're a, a man or a woman from a country, that you'll have different things that you're dealing with. Um, they find that their own culture starts to separate slightly and this, this love story that we have at the beginning of the book becomes one about letting somebody go, I suppose. Um, was that the first impetus for writing the book? About, was, it, was it the love story or was it the idea of dealing with this um, issue of, of refugees and movement of people around the world? Well, the, the starting point for the novel was these doors. Um, this, this notion that people would suddenly begin to move instantaneously from one place to another. But very quickly, the novel became a novel about um, migration, not simply as a geographic movement of people, but as a fundamental condition of every human being and transience. Um, the notion that uh, everything changes and that we lose everything in the end of our lives. And that it's still possible despite um, sort of gazing quite um, firmly upon the reality of transience to still experience love and tenderness and beauty and optimism. And so a particular kind of relationship began to form. And that relationship was uh, the story of Seda Nadia, which is the story of a first love. And, and you know, we, when we say first love, what we usually mean by that is that there was presumably a second and third love, otherwise we would just say it's a story of a love. Mm. Um, first loves are the loves that um, we have let go of. And so uh, to me, uh, the nature of what form a letting go can take, you know, can letting go actually contain within it something quite beautiful, uh, became interesting. And so, and so this is a, um, a love story about people who are changing uh, and uh, um, and along the way, um, you know, find a kind of non-possessive nature to their relationship because love can mean, you know, I love you can mean that, um, you know, I want to own you or you make me less lonely and therefore I want to keep you in my proximity. But it can also mean uh, a less possessive thing, which is I desire that you be less lonely. And that sort of less selfish kind of love, um, more self-transcending love, strikes me as worth examining because in our culture, where the self is continually being reinforced by everything from the market to politics to popular culture, uh, we, um, we in our self-obsessed moment uh, are finding ourselves utterly unprepared for transience and change, and that becomes a problem.